question about the work we are doing around these webinars uh, from Studio in Half. So we, almost all of us, actually did not need a COVID-19 to say that India's urban system is faltering and our cities are not in really good health. In, health. Um, in most respects, whether it is the economy or the environment or governance of finance or institutions, or for that matter, informality in terms of slums, the sustainability or mobility. I mean, the list is actually endless depending on where we start and where what our vantage point is. And some of us have also started taking baby steps in search for correctives and better ways of seeing and doing things. However, one of the fallout of managing COVID-19 crisis is the sharp focus in which the informal economy has suffered. Now, going forward beyond the virus crisis, the country will have to see that if nearly 90% of our labor force is in the informal economy, there are conditions of working. Why? The entire social contract must change. Also, we cannot leave the slum dwellers and the poor in the conditions of ill health, misery, and want that they're forced into. And to add to that, the double whammy is in terms of the climate change knocking on our door, if not already in, both in terms of short-term problem solving and long-term planning must reckon with the sustainability compulsions and framework. With all these, cities will need to be rethought and restructured. And changing all this is no small challenge, even if COVID-19 shock leaves us with a new mindset and resolve to pursue change. There are many scenarios as to what the country, its economy, its systems, and its approach to the old and new challenges will look like. For obvious reasons, the swing is between extreme ends. If you take a somewhat pessimistic but most likely scenario, which projects the new normal as old normal, with minor symbolic shuffle here and there, and inconsequential tinkering of the old vintage, not much may change. It is not unlikely that the day lockdown is fully lifted or two to three months down the line, the virus is gone from the TV screen and the government orders on what to do and what not to do cease coming. People could be rushing, running and honking horns to offices and factories and shops and Kadyanaka to catch up with the lost months, wasted salaries, stalled production, missed income, and of course, sinking GDP. And as and when elections in Bihar and West Bengal are announced, we would be our normal, original self-vibrant, noisy, and crowd-loving democracy. Corona pandemic as if did not happen. I mean, actually, you can see that now when you walk around the cities, it doesn't feel like Corona has really hit us with the way we are moving around. So do not get me wrong. The idea is not to write off the change before it has been articulated. The small point is this that even though there is a chance that we, our systems and approaches could be different, a suggestion is that we see the change process embedded in the old normal rather than the new normal. Seeing it practically with governance, attitude, institutions, and mindset, not very different. The proposed webinars are seen as opening the much needed societal dialogue on how we handle urbanization processes and develop cities so that they remain engines of growth minus the exploitative instincts and systems, people, especially the working class, environment, and nature. To cut the story short, let me revoke the famous Panchshila of the Kunantan Declaration of the kind of cities we want, that is economically productive, socially just, politically participative, participatory, environmentally sustainable, and culturally vibrant city. Technologically adoptive while also being people-centric too. The reason for selecting this time is that people are ready to deal with the virtual presence in a reflective frame of mind, even if temporarily. Prepare to invest energy and timing in things they would not in normal times and are receptive to ideas. There is a sense of occasion for such an initiative and the suggestion is to grab it. The logic behind 25 webinars is to be able to handle the complexity of the subject adequately. One or two would leave much unsaid and unaddressed. So there are three themes that have been selected overall. The following are the broad themes. Titles and tentatives, 
and suggest. Titles are tentative and suggestive. Purpose is to suggest possible coverage and sub themes. The team in charge of the particular webinar will make necessary re-articulating. The webinar series is an integral part of and will feed into an initiative we have launched last year called Securi, that is Citizen Urban Initiative. It is about a multi-level, multidisciplinary societal effort spearheaded by some of India's leading urban and related professionals, development thinkers, and practitioners to work on a blueprint that outlines the country's response to the complex urban challenge in a way that ensures productive, inclusive, sustainable, livable, and humane cities for a happy people and an equitable and harmonious society. That is reassessing India's urban challenge, rethinking Indian cities, and reformulating response in the context of national development challenges, not only urban challenges, is the task. Preparative work is on. And um, before I uh, pass it on uh, next to the colleagues here, I would also strongly encourage you to record, uh, register yourself for the next seminar that, is, that will be shared with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sunil, for this uh, introduction. Um, good morning to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone in Asia. It's a pleasure to be introducing uh, our webinar to you. Um, this webinar is a collaboration between INHOF and the housing group of IHS, and we would like to thank INHOF for inviting us to be part of this great and important initiative. We are very excited to be here, and our special thanks go to Kirti Shah and his, and his team for getting this organized. Um, I have a few words before we start on uh, the organization of this webinar. As usual, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and not in the chat section. Um, and these will then be discussed in discussion after the presentations. In case we have too many questions, we will answer the remaining ones after the, after the webinar to the extent possible. Um, we have 15 minutes per presentation and a maximum of uh, 20 to 25 minutes for the discussion, which will be moderated by Bahar. And then we have a final wrap up by Banasri. And we intend to finish between uh, 90 to uh, 80 to 90 minutes. Um, Shivani, could you please share the video as an introduction to the theme? Thank you. This, this clearly sets the stage of what we will address. I will now share my screen with you for a very short introduction. Um, yeah, so the theme is housing rights and riverfront development in Asian uh, cities. And what this pandemic has shown us with regards to housing is the interconnectedness of housing, health and sanitation, food security and livelihoods. Besides, it's also shown us the scale of the challenge with respect to the number of people living in precarious situations worldwide. Um, in this webinar, we will zoom into the current riverfront development projects in Asia and the lessons that can be drawn with respect to the impact on low income communities. In many Asian cities, rivers are being restored in an effort to clean up heavily polluted rivers and protect against floods, whereby informal settlements or encroachments located in objectionable locations, meaning flood prone and low lying areas along the river are being destroyed 
and its inhabitants moved to the periphery into resettlement sites, as for instance in Ahmedabad, Chennai, Manila, and Jakarta. And the question is who benefits and who pays the price for this type of development? Can we continue to move the urban poor out to far off and isolated places, rehouse them in high rise apartment blocks that lack access to basic services, schools, hospitals, and most importantly, livelihoods? Settlements that are in violation with the right to adequate housing, that pose a threat to health and livelihoods? Or is it time to rethink this, this development model? We will therefore zoom into three cases from Asia. Lahore, Pakistan, where the government is intending to start a riverfront development project. Chennai, India, where many evictions have already taken place along the city's rivers and thousands of people have been moved to large scale resettlement sites. And the Philippines, where in some cases communities have been in charge of their own resettlement. The questions that we would like to address in this webinar are what are the lessons that can be learned from current riverfront development projects and its impact on low-income communities? What needs to change with regards to realizing the right to adequate housing for communities affected by riverfront development? And if resettlement just cannot be avoided, how can it work better for those relocated? Um, I would like to introduce our great team of speakers. I'm moving to the next slide, yeah. So we're very happy with three wonderful experts. Um, our first speaker is Rabia Esdi. Rabia works as an associate professor at the National Arts College in Lahore, and she also works for the Nigran e Lahore, a voluntary association of urbanists concerned with a people-centered development of the city of Lahore. Our second speaker is Vanessa Peter. She's a policy researcher and social activist and a member of many committees monitoring state housing and resettlement initiatives. In 2013, Vanessa started the Information and Resource Center for the Deprived Urban Communities, IRCDUC, which is a social initiative that seeks to address the disconnect between the poor, policy and policymakers. And our third speaker is Dr. Melissa Navarra. She's an assistant professor at Ateneo de Manila University she has over two decades of government experience in involuntary resettlement and housing prior to joining the university. Besides that, she's the managing director of Jolie Homes Foundation, an NGO that implements community organizing in informal settlements and resettlement sites. Okay, and now without further delay, please Rabia, go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, so... All right, you can hear me? Yes? And I'm guessing you can see the screen? <clears throat> Marta, you can hear me, right? Yes? Okay. Um, okay, so I don't have a lot of time at all, and this is a very intense topic. So I will start right away. Um, we are looking at the Ravi Riverfront Development Project in Lahore. Um, and this project has just been inaugurated about uh, 10 days ago uh, by the Prime Minister. So it's just in its planning stage right now. And um, the way we are looking at this project is through the lens of the river as a habitat or the river as a living uh, entity, as opposed to just you know being a you know, water body. So. Um, so to start with, we wanted to see uh, the different typologies of how settlements are, have located themselves around rivers. Uh, so that there were two typologies that we came across. One is the one in which the river uh, is central to the city. And so the city is uh, you know, based on both banks of the river and the river actually acts like a, almost as like a uniting force. And the other example is the city of Lahore, for example, cities like Lahore, where the city is located on one bank of the river and um, the river acts almost like a boundary between the other bank and this bank and different cities on each bank. Um, so just to define how we're looking at this and how we're looking at the river, the river is habitat. The river manifests the concepts of settlement and habitat. It is never unpartnered. It is never a water body alone. It is a force that engulfs, enables, um, enables and marries living entities together human, animal, plant, and the elements. It is civilizations, settlements, and communities, and wanderers. The river is, in other words, an entire life force 
around which imaginations and the constructs of how to live and what to live for are formed. This is the way we are looking at the river or defining it so far. Coming to the technical uh, detail or the technical information, so this uh, project is located at the urban core of uh, Punjab, uh, the Punjab province in Pakistan. And this urban core includes Lahore, which is Pakistan's second largest city. Uh, and then the cities of Shekhupura, Shadra, and Kasur, uh, and others in the same area. Uh, just to give you an, uh, a bit of context, Lahore has a population of 12 million people currently. Um, also, uh, just to clarify, the Ravi is not typically uh, a healthy river, or it's not even a typical river in that sense. Um, it is all the raw sewage of Lahore actually goes into the Ravi, untreated. And so it's a very polluted river. Um, Secondly, in 1960, after the Indus Waters Treaty, a lot of the control of the Ravi's River was given to India, which means that the flow of, the, uh, of water in the river is also not uh, you know, natural, so to speak. Um, then we come to the river topography briefly. So if we look at the lower diagram over here, if we look at zones two and three, the Ravi uh, and the urban core that we're talking about is basically located in this area between zones two and three. So this is where Lahore, Shekhupura, and Chadra Lai. And uh, the river is, of course, providing a lot of ecosystem services, despite the fact that it's not a typical healthy river. Um, what are the forces of change around this river? Of course, the main force is urban expansion and you know, things such as livelihood activities for people. But again, I would like to emphasize that it's not a river which is you know, within the city. It lies almost like a backyard of the city. Although it's performing very important functions, it's, it's almost like a backyard. Um, you see a lot of housing in the form of Juggi Bastis, village settlements, and consolidated urban housing. You see a lot of agriculture and um, livelihood opportunities and livelihood activities. Um, we are looking at this habitat idea in terms of these three variables, and we're saying that ecosystems, people, and economies, they work together in this area, in the Ravi River, and along its banks, obviously. Um, I will not go into the detail of this because this image, this you know, visual should explain a lot of things, and we will look at this in detail in the next few slides. So it's these three variables that work together and that depend on each other constantly. In terms of land use, uh, the one thing I want to point out on this map is that uh, agriculture makes up for 72% of land in this area, uh, in the project area, in the project boundary, and. Um, this is a little misleading because when we say agriculture, we actually mean a lot of people also depending on this, a uh, lot of village communities, a lot of people employed as daily wage uh, laborers for uh, agriculture. So this is an entire system uh, which is both social, economic, and cultural. So agriculture does not just mean fields, you know. Uh, this uh, image gives you an idea of all that the Ravi actually contains at this point. So you have on its uh, left bank, uh, you know, government uh, forest reserves, you have agricultural uh, areas, you have the production of uh, fruit and, uh, you know, uh, the production of also roses uh, for, for sale. Uh, in the background, you have a whole bridge and a series of bridges which join both banks together and also provide livelihood opportunities for the very poor people. Um, you have shrines and cultural activities going on uh, in a big way. And very importantly, you have sand mining, uh, taking out sand from the river for the construction industry, and a, a huge uh, amount of buffalo herding communities because water buffaloes need water to survive. Um, then uh, we uh, were looking at, uh, oops, I don't know if the title is showing, but okay. We were looking at the people aspect, and we were looking at the fact that people have two types of relationships with the river, if we look at it in a macro sort of a level. One is a relationship of proximity or locational advantage in which people are located on the river because the river is providing them certain opportunities, like the buffalo herding communities, like informal workers and uh, vendors and the you know beggars. Uh, and of course, livestock uh, owners and landowners and la people who are working on these lands. Uh, in terms of housing, you have, again, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but a lot of informal settlements, many of which are nomadic settlements. Um, in terms of culture, you have a lot of shrine activity in this area. Um, you have a number of shrines, and so a lot of people visit these shrines. You have recreation in the form of boating, uh, and you have this, this cultural offering, kind of a religious offering thing called sadka, which is very, very common here. Um, the economy part, uh, I mean, the economy part obviously overlaps with the people and this whole housing and, you know, culture part. But I just want to point out that there are two types of, three types of economy. 
The two types here, the small and medium, are what already exist. Uh, so again, uh, the daily wage workers and the informal vendors in terms of the small economies. The medium-sized economies include the sand mining uh, for the construction industry, uh, transporters, of course, uh, some medium-sized industries uh, located here, and of course, also agriculture. And the mega doesn't exist right now. Of course, the Ravi Riverfront Development Project is a mega project. So the mega economy comes in with that. Um, and so coming back to the project itself, the Riverfront Development Project, the project is typical of the world-class city model uh, development of you know, the, the South Asia, South Asian cities or the developing world cities. It was first uh, introduced in 2013. And then it was uh, you know, canceled uh, because of some financial issues. And now it's being introduced again uh, by the government. It has been introduced. I mean, it's been uh, introduced in the newspapers and inaugurated also. So how are they packaging this project? That's very interesting uh, for us because the main uh, element uh, in this packaging of the project and making it very acceptable and making it very you know, uh, pro-development in the way it's uh, in the narrative is that they're saying they, they want to conserve the beauty and the aesthetics of the Ravi. Uh, river. They want to revitalize its uh, e uh, ecological function. They want to clean it up. They want to do river channelization. Uh, so sustainability, this typical, very uh, common, you know, popular word comes in. They're saying they want to conserve archaeological features in the area. And they're also saying that they want to uplift marginalized communities, uh, which, you know, is very doubtful, but okay, it's always good to talk about these things in a in a project outline. And the real actual focus is actually acquiring land for upper end uh, development um, and lease or sale to different uh, investors, to different high end, large uh, mega investors, you could say, and different financing options like uh, private public partnerships and you know land value capture and all of this. Um, the project is actually the project area is the size of one third of London which means it's almost like a medium sized or you know city uh, the total cost of the project is about 29 billion dollars and the just the planning and pre feasibility cost has is 3.2 million dollars so this is all going from our tax uh, money and this is the projection of uh, what it actually uh, you know what they want it to look like i mean i think uh, i just saw the presentation in the, in the beginning of this and it was very similar uh, so this is the projection, and I want to compare this quickly with what they are, what exists right now. So this is what we have, and this is this is what we, what is being proposed. So really, uh, kind of ridiculous, frankly. Um, they're phasing it out into different uh, segments in terms of time. So the phase one will obviously happen first. And uh, what I want to show also is the zoning plan. This is a very initial zoning plan. I mean, it's not final, obviously, but. Um, it just shows that it's a very synthetic approach. It's not looking at any of the existing activities. It's not looking at the systems. It's not looking at the interrelation between the three things that we pointed out, for example, ecology, economy, and people. Uh, it is just very synthetic. It, does not, it has no respect for what exists, basically. Um, and also, importantly, this project is only going to become possible, battery is running low. Uh, the project is only going to become possible because in this project area, you have a number of high speed uh, motorways and these were built uh, mostly in the past decade. So, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, and without these, because this is a very vehicle friendly or vehicle oriented development model and the target group is also upper income, the upper income audience. So these motorways are what actually enable this idea of this kind of development and urban sprawl to actually happen. And without this, this would never, this would never have taken place. Coming back to the slightly philosophical um, uh, angle, um, you know, how, in what ways can land and natural resources be um, framed in, in, a different, in a certain development model? So, uh, you know, in our understanding, there are three basic models that we understand. The first is the neoliberal model, which is what this project is based in, where you take land, you take natural resources, and you say that they need to be exploited for their capital value. And it doesn't matter if that, uh, if that if the target audience or the beneficiaries are a very small um, minority, which is a, a very wealthy minority. There's no room for equity. So it's just that you have to exploit it for its capital gain. The second is the ecology central uh, centric model, which says that the river is and nature and the environment is above all, uh, you know, the most supreme. So everything has to be done to conserve that. And the third is what we are talking about, which says that land and natural resources belong to the public, belong to the people, 
So this is a public trust model where all of this is a public trust and whatever is done to it, whether it's upgraded or cleaned or whatever development happens, it should be for the benefit of the vast majority of people, the cross section of the population. Um, because it's a public trust and it belongs to all of us. Um, just the last few slides now, because I'm running out of time. Now, um, coming back to the, the Prime Minister, I don't know if you can see this top bar, but okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, the Prime Minister's recent statement about the project. So he says, I feel great excitement uh, about this project because it's one of the biggest mega projects that we have launched in our history and it will save Lahore by stopping the spread of unplanned sprawl and raise the water table, etc. So, you know, uh, focusing on the environment aspect and also saying it's a mega project, so it's a great economic, um, you know, um, project. Um, in a bit of a contradiction, if you look at a few months ago, the government also announced that no more agricultural land is going to be converted into urban land. So there should be no more construction on agricultural land. This was one claim made by the government before this. Another claim was made uh, as a policy, which was that you know the city should not uh, sprawl horizontally any longer and that we now want to go vertical because we want to conserve land and agricultural land. So we see a couple of contradictions obviously, but um, what we basically see through all of this, all of these scenarios is that one, there will be a lot of large scale eviction and displacement that will take place. Um, and we have seen this in the form of already existing uh, upper, upper income housing development models in Pakistan's large cities uh, by large uh, powerful developers, such as DHA and Beria, where exactly this is done, um, or agricultural land is bought by village settle settlers. Um, the village communities are mostly you know, wiped out. I mean, it's okay, they're, they're bought out, but um, there's a lot of pressure to sell also. And it's, it's kind of, uh, it is exploitative because the money they get for the land looks like a lot at first, but if you compare it proportionately with the actual value of the land or the market value, it's very little. Uh, so it's exactly the same model. It is based on urban sprawl. Basically, this is urban sprawl. Uh, there will be displacement, there will be gentrification. Uh, so there will be a, a housing crisis that will be set in motion. And secondly, the, the cleaning of the river, can only happen in our opinion uh, when there's political will. So it's not enough to just make a plan and say we're gonna clean the river. There has to be political will and it seems to be a little doubtful at this point. Um, so we're looking at the revitalization of rivers and riverine areas as public luxuries for all, not just private luxuries for a few people. You know, this belongs to all of us. And finally, in our recommendations, what do, does the Ravi River really need? So first of all, it's very clear and we can't argue about the fact that, you know, we do need a river uh, revitalization. Uh, there's no question about that. There is an environmental crisis. But, uh, you know, with that, we need to um, protect the needs and the, the housing security of low-income communities. So there has to be a policy for that. There has to be a policy for controlling land speculation because land speculation usually leads to gentrification. Um, there has to be, uh, you know, a policy for controlling um, this entire model because uh, this will lead to displacement and you know simple things like land banks which we are not going to discuss right now but just to mention uh, we need to you know uh, safeguard the livelihoods of buffalo uh, herding communities uh, the agricultural communities and of course the biodiversity over here and uh, one of the proposals of civil society right now is to declare all of this a national park uh, but this is only 25 percent of the land the rest of it nobody really knows so we are saying you know I mean, it's ideal, but this project is just flawed in many, many ways. Um, and of course, the biggest thing is to, con you know, to protect the rights of the very poor. Uh, I think I'm out of time, am I? Yes? Yeah, it's enough, this is the last slide. <laughs> How many seconds do I have? Yeah, it's fine, this is, the, this is it. Uh, so I think we are done. Um, and we look forward to learning from the work of other uh, presentations and people, uh, you know, cities who have seen this kind of thing already happen. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Rabia and your team. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, well, it's clear that this case is still on the drawing board. It's interesting you mentioned the slogan uh, that um, marginalized communities will be uplifted which is very interesting uh, what does that mean uh, we will now move to the to the other case from chennai where the consequences of this type of neoliberal interventions have already been felt on many of the urban poor so um, vanessa please go ahead thank you so can we have the presentation please radhika 
so uh, yeah can we have the presentation with radhika is must be having it yeah thank you so uh, greetings to everyone so uh, basically uh, we have uh, what we will be sharing is our uh, three years journey especially on documenting the various evictions that has been happening and uh, this presentation is going to uh, basically highlight how the riverfront development in chennai has affected the right to adequate housing of the communities the next slide please yeah and uh, can we have the next slide yeah so this is the uh, uh, slide depicting where chennai is so in india chennai is located in tamil nadu which is the southern part and chennai is the capital city of tamil nadu and if you were to look at uh, chennai it is also known as the city of thousand tanks because you've got immense number of water bodies and the three major rivers that uh, runs through uh, chennai are kosathalaya adyar and kuvam so this presentation will be talking more, focusing more about adyar and kuvam rivers where we've had massive uh, evictions yeah next slide please yes so uh, if you were to look at uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, we've had a series of uh, high court orders, you know, court is, uh, orders from the court of law, which uh, has been uh, saying that the waterfront has to be conserved, restored, and hence, you know, the people who are uh, encroachers needs to be uh, evicted. So, uh, if you look at it, right from two thousand six, one of the where one of the massive evictions happened in and around Chennai in a place called Poru. and uh, in the pretext of climate change and ecological restoration so one of the things that the state government has been doing is that they said removal of encroachers is the only solution for restoration of water bodies and uh, and here you know the term encroachers when we talk about encroachers if you uh, you know closely look at the various affidavits which are submitted by government of tamil nadu to the madras high court you will realize only the informal settlement will be classified as encroachers so uh, our argument is that, that the poor are not encroachers but settlers because uh, right from the rural areas as well as the urban areas we've seen that the deprived communities often settle only in the available non titled government land that are usually not in demand or in possession of the affluent communities so these are the only lands available for the deprived communities or marginalized communities to settle and hence we choose to use the word uh, you know settlers and not just uh, uh, encroachers because this uh, the the reason why these communities settle in these areas are linked directly linked to the historical marginalization process so uh, unfortunately you know uh, the the language of law you know brands these settlements of marginalized communities as illegal without taking uh, you know the consideration the trends of histor historical marginalization and this trend of you know specifically targeting the uh, poor and the vulnerable sections you know uh, and evicting them is definitely an act of discrimination next slide please yeah so uh, and uh, and the state wide propaganda which has been used by the government as well as the various interest group is that uh, that the poor are the reason for the destruction of environment so this has been always used as an argument but however we have realized that you know couple of studies by the government itself one 1989 there was a study on water courses of greater madras which says less than 1% of the population of the uh, i mean less than 1% of the pollution of the river can be attributed to the informal settlements and likewise in 1995 there was yet another uh, report a government report which was an action plan for urban waterways improvement so there again they said that the untreated or the partially treated effluents from metro water that is the government body is the reason for is the far more important reason for the pollution in kuwam and adyar rivers however the articulation which has been made is that that the poor are the reason for you know polluting the river the poor the encroachment of by the poor is the reason for why chennai got flooded in the year 2015 so uh, we find that there is no alternative use in terms of why shouldn't people be included in the restoration process so eventually the kind of propaganda that is being used has fueled the misperception between communities 
and which has resulted in a lack of public support when communities are being evicted in mass okay so uh, and if you look at the kind of uh, river restoration project that chennai has been promoting we find that it is a deliberate attempt to promote a model of environment conservation that is anti poor and anti human rights the next few slides will be talking about you know will be elaborating on this argument next slide please so uh, we have seen that you know whenever uh, communities especially to uh, chennai witness a huge flood in massive flood in 2015 and ever since that we find that uh, there has been a historically very uh, what do i say one of those massive evictions that has uh, happened and people who were living in the heart of the city were pushed to the city margins and at times you know were pushed to completely to uh, uh, rural areas which were completely disconnected in remote locations and isolated so this act of you know deliberately moving a huge uh, uh, you know uh, number of people outside the city is definitely a kind of a socio spatial segregation because there were no instances where the alternatives were uh, you know proximate resettlement was even thought about or in situ upgradation in many cases so uh, this has had a huge impact in the these evictions have had a huge impact on the right to life housing security of the person health education food water and sanitation and it is very uh, unfortunate that out of all the evictions 90% of the evictions were carried out during the middle of the academic year which meant many children had uh, dropped out of schools and uh, we've also seen that in all of these evictions in all of these evictions that's 100% of these evictions there were no due processes which were carried out which had violated the human right to adequate framework yeah next slide please so uh, this is the number of uh, families which have been identified by government who are residing in the major water bodies of chennai so uh, we've seen that about 50000 uh, 50096 families were identified by government for uh, you know evicting them and moving them to the uh, resettlement site of which most of the evictions so far till date has been carried out in the banks of vajra river and the kuvam river next slide please so you will uh, realize that uh, you know the settlements which are uh, these are some of the huge resettlement sites which were established by government of tamil nadu all located in the fringes of the city in other districts which is creating a whole lot of confusion in terms of you know access to entitlements and basic facilities so we have realized uh, out of the 14000 odd families who were residing in kuvam almost 10676 families were evicted in the last 3 years okay and out of the uh, you know 8000 odd families and 9000 odd families were residing in the banks of uh, uh, adyar we have had 3024 families who were already evicted okay so uh, this is one of the biggest problems so we've had massive uh, evictions which have been carried out and there was absolutely no support from the public or the policy maker because it said it you know people were pushed against environment and said if you want to conserve if you don't want the city to be flooded it's better that you move them and it is i would like to point out the only commercial establishment that was removed as part of the project was unfortunately a home for the mentally ill you know this is and there were lots of these big hotels which are right inside jutting inside the rivers which are just remain untouched so that's the uh, irony of all of this river restoration process the next slide please so uh, this is one of the photographs that i wanted to show that this is the kuvam river and uh, you know the, the empty space shows the settlement which was evicted and uh, you will realize that in the other side of the river you will have all big buildings but only the you know buildings which were you only the informal settlements were uh, you know evicted the next slide please so the uh, next slide will show you a kind of a couple of these things about uh, the eviction process it took place even at night time violating the international standard there was absolutely no prior information provided to the communities and in the last two photographs you know the in the bottom of the screen screen if you look at it you will find that there was intimidation there was coercion and uh, there were as many number of police to compare to the number of families who were evicted in many cases our people had to go and read the order for the communities to tell them where exactly they were being moved because they were completely kept in the dark yeah the next slide 
So uh, I was telling about how we did not get any sort of a public support uh, or any support from uh, you know the policymakers. But I would also like to see some of those uh, you know judgments that were issued by the Madras High Court on encroachment, just to make you understand how this entire the argument was so lopsided. So uh, one of those argue, uh, one of those judgments said that encroaches can be removed by use of force. Okay, and uh, there was another judgment which said it's reasonable amount of force, and we one doesn't know what actually reasonable amount of force means and could be violated. Second, uh, the courts. Uh, this is one of those orders which said the civil courts are not restrained from entertaining any petition for injunction on uh, relating to encroachment of water bodies, which simply means communities who are located even in the uh, interior areas uh, have to go to the high court to access justice because you cannot go to the lower courts. And, uh, you know, which simply means the communities need to be uh, geographically and economically accessible to ensure to access justice. So this was one of those judgments like that. And uh, the third uh, major judgment, one of those judgments said, cessation of all government benefits to those living uh, or occupying land along the water bodies. So under this, there were electricity uh, disconnected, water connection was disconnected, and it went to an issue uh, to the extent of no issuance of voter and electoral identity cards. So this is the kind of language of law, you know, the various high court orders. The next slide, please. And. Uh, there were also other few, uh, you know, uh, you know, interpretations by the Madras High Court, which needs to be looked at. One was government should ensure that, you know, no alternative shelter should be provided for those who are residing in the riverbanks because they said that the court feels it's it's encouraging encroachments. OK. And the second thing is that they said citizens who have acted in violation of their fundamental duty, that is, uh, you know, preventing environment cannot be heard to complain about deprivation of fundamental rights. So these were all some of those, you know, judgments which had interpreted and criminalized the encroachers. See, this is what has been happening. So the encroachers, or especially the informal settlements who were branded as encroach encroachers were criminalized. The next slide, please. So uh, to keep it uh, very short, you know, most of these particular settlements that I've been talking about, which are located in the peripheral areas of the city or the fringes of the city, uh, you know, witnessed a lot of problems, especially during the pandemic. The pandemic has actually exposed the fallacy of this entire housing program that was, uh, you know, uh, con constructed. These were all high rise tenemental, you know, G plus eight and G plus ground plus four floor kind of a tenements, which are extremely congested. So if the idea of the government was to construct, you know, non congested settlement, the resettlement did not work. And if the idea of the government was to construct disaster resilient houses, these uh, houses constructed in the resettlement were anywhere closer to disaster resilient uh, buildings. And third, if the government wanted to really conserve the environment, you know, restore the environment, they wouldn't be constructing these, they wouldn't be putting up these massive housing settlements in ecologically sensitive lands. You know, it just doesn't, you know, work that way. So uh, these were some of the things and uh, the major resettlement sites where these families were uh, resettled to witness spike in COVID-19 cases. And there was the flaw of the existing housing programs posed as a challenge in the prevention control measures of COVID-19. So it was very difficult because it was highly congested buildings, you know. And because of the existing vulnerabilities that was there, after resettlement and loss of livelihood and no, uh, you know, um, you know, measures to improve their livelihood, the lockdown came as a big death knell for many of the families because, uh, they, you know, they were already in a vulnerable situation and it further increased the vulnerability. The next slide, please. Yeah. So, uh, what? Uh, Specifically, the way forward from our side is that there needs to be an inclusive riverfront conservation problem projects wherein communities are consulted. And the state should not resort to any <coughs> forced eviction. And there should not be construction of en masse housing projects. You know, like we have Kanaginaga having 23,000, Perumbakam having another 23,000, all located in the uh, fringes of the city, creating ghettos by itself. And uh, the state should ensure that the future housing program should focus on in situ upgradation or development. And in worst case possible, it should be proximate resettlement within three kilometers. And our big, uh, one of the things that we've been advocating with the government is to create, uh, is to develop and implement a human, race, uh, human rights based, gender sensitive, child friendly framework on housing. Yeah, thank you.
Terrific. Thank you. Vanessa, very well said. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for this very good and clear presentation. So this case presents a clear uh, violation of the right to adequate housing in Chennai. Um, now we move over to, to Melissa, to the Philippines. She will present a case where one could draw lessons from with regards to having affected communities take control of the resettlement process in order to ensure adequate housing and respect housing rights. Melissa, please go ahead. Okay. Thanks so much for the organizers of this uh, webinar and hello to everyone on the web with us. I'm delighted to share with you this afternoon here in the Philippines, um, few positive initiatives in this in the settlement context. So just before me, Vanessa already gave us a clear picture on the economic and social costs of eviction and involuntary resettlement to the receiving communities and also the, to the resettlers across all sectors, the women, men, the children, the PWDs, and the older adults. No? Our hearts sank because of this uh, um, stories. We ask, is this the default outcome for the involuntary resettlers? That if we talk about involuntary resettlement, we're also featuring guaranteed worse off living conditions of the families in the global south, such as in India and in the Philippines. So my presentation covers two counter narratives of resettled families who are able to change their outcomes and still changing it into something that is full of hope and it's because of their collective action. The first counter narrative is about the 30,000 informal settler families who were resettled in 18 resettlement sites, uh, 30 to 50 kilometers away from their uh, origin in uh, Metro Manila. So it's similar with those happening in uh, Chennai and also in Ravi River. So however, from 2013 to 2014, there are already mounting evidence and complaints that the families were barely surviving in their new communities. But of course, most of these are just anecdotes. And um, if you uh, submit anecdotes to the government, the governments are supposed to uh, supply all the social uh, services, they will not listen. So, so with my resettlement team in the Presidential Commission for the Urban Poor, I was still in the government then, that also includes community organizers, we designed a participatory research with the leaders in the resettlement sites. So, so we went down to uh, the resettlement sites. So the participatory research was a combination of surveys, interviews, and FGDs. We did it with the leaders, as you can see on the picture, and um, also with the other residents in the communities. So findings. Well, the findings are not really different from uh, what have been uh, put forth by uh, relevant studies. Families resettled in this off-site from 2013 to 2016 are worse off because of job loss and economic dislocation. Of course, there's a decrease in income ranging from 8 to 57 percent, and the basic and social services are inadequate. Sometimes in some communities, they're lacking. The other communities even said that, uh, you know, uh, they're supposed to be uh, brought to safer locations. But then they said, what happened to us is that we were transferred from danger zones into death zone suburbs. So as you can see on the left picture, the community is standing right next to a quarry site. So if it rains hard, there will be soil erosion, land erosion. And the picture on your right side, uh, it's just few of the communities that uh, with prolonged heavy rains, the entire community will get swamped and it will take like weeks for the communities to clean up the entire place. So what happened then is that we presented the findings to the residents, not just to the elites, not just to the leaders of the community. And it was during this series of meetings and consultations that the leaders and the entire community decided to report their situation in the 18 resettlement sites to the government agencies. They asked about opportunity. What's the opportunity right now? 
And then we told them that that time there was this ongoing national housing summit. So it was uh, being uh, uh, hosted by the lower house and by Senate. So it will be a perfect opportunity for them to share their stories. Okay. So it happened. So the leaders, as assisted by our resettlement team in the commission, prepared for these opportunities to be heard in Congress twice. So they presented in Congress twice. They did the reporting themselves, no? the women, men, and even some youth combining the stories and hard data. They demanded for the social services in their communities, the schools, the health centers, the livelihood capital. So in 2017, uh, around 1.8 billion or 37 billion US dollars was released as remedy funds for these 18 sites. It's the first time in the country that uh, such budget was released as corrective funds. By 2019, some of the facilities they were waiting for, such as this secondary school, had been built. Meanwhile, by 2018, the resettlement standards that uh, we based this 1.8 billion request were established as a result of the 18 resettlement site stories. So it was also adopted by the Human Settlements Department. Next story is uh, about families who were facing demolition and eviction, but wanted a different housing modality. Not something that is not like what happened to uh, the 18 sites uh, residents. No? So they wanted the people's plan, which is a participatory approach to resettlement. So what is people's plan? People's plan is an alternative shelter planning approach. It's bottom-up principle in development planning. So it's really a contrast to the traditional top-down approach of the government. It's, um, it's both a process and a product in its sense because while the community uh, works on their uh, uh, people's plan, they're also generating the plan itself. It hinges on community organizing and capacity building that's uh, being done by partner NGOs. So now we see here um, the value of the NGO partners and other civil society organizations in empowering, capacitating, and partnering with these uh, communities. So you can see uh, an example of how they do the people's plan. So it's not just the leaders who decide. That's why it's called people's plan. It's community-led. It should be a public um, decision. It's a collective decision. Everything from the design, from the site location. So they wanted it in city. Most of the people's plan are in city. So the women, women are mostly the leaders in this people's plan approach because you know they stay in the communities. Um, most of them are homemakers. So they also wanted a nice house for their family. So they decide even on the design, even on the number of pets that uh, they can uh, um, bring into their units. So everything is a collective decision. So this is an example of a finished people's plan. So in um, the community, we're able to have their people's plan project get funding in the end from the government. For this example, 480 families now live in the eight buildings built. And this location is just right across the waterways they came from. So they found this site, they did research. Compared to the traditional approach that registers 30% payment collection, sometimes it's much lower even, people's plan projects loud of 90 to 100 percent payment collection rate because families are happy with the units that they own. So what are the gains of uh, people's plan of the community-led approach? Well, the actions of the resettled families and the people's plan proponents demonstrate their capacity to formulate and implement a community scale project. And this should erase our notion towards the poor that they are passive recipient of dole outs and charities given, you know, uh, the opportunities they can formulate and even implement their own project. 
it increases and expands the family stocks of social capital. Before the project, they're just merely neighbors. They're just merely uh, friends, no? But after the pro during the project, they've become project partners. And they've um, harnessed their bonds. they built bridges. They even uh, um, expanded their networks to linkages with the government, with the politicians, with uh, those in power. It jump starts, accelerates, and sustains the process of community organizing. So the community-led projects that these families went through have been by vital in maintaining cohesion in the community. And amid the pandemic, their solidarity has become invaluable in managing and surviving the pandemic in their own setting. But of course, As you can see, the ch changing the long-established paradigm for housing resettlement is not impossible. And these people-led transformations can only underscore the power of an organized community and for allocating decision-making spaces for our partner communities in informal settlements and resettlement sites. But how do we continue moving forward? How, we do, how do we sustain the movement for development? And there are several steps that we still need to take. First, we should all recognize that apart from the right to adequate housing, urban poor families also have the right to the city. And that cities are not just meant for middle class and upper class. According to the right to, to the city framework, cities are spaces not just for capital accumulation, but also for human interaction constructed by mobilization and social processes. Likewise, it's not just the middle class and upper class who are citizens of the cities and therefore should enjoy the services, but also our urban poor, who we fail to see as both the informal settlers and also our workforce, the source of cheap labor to the capit capitalists, our house health, our drivers, no? who like the rest contribute to the city and therefore should also be afforded the social services they need from the state. Nonetheless, we only see them as informal settlers who can be pushed from the center to the periphery 30 to 50 kilometers from the city. Housing the poor should not be source of capital accumulation, but should be viewed as social investment for the families, for the children, for the youth, that the returns are not in the form of profit, but in the forms of improving the well-being of the children and the upcoming generations who will soon contribute to the society. These best practices also being produced by this cohesive, empowered urban poor, by co-production, co-implementation, uh, co-benefits should be mainstream and institutionalized so that they just uh, uh, stop as being the best practice, no? so that there would be more options for the sector to choose from and that greater number of poor families can access this. Next. Pushing for reforms in the housing and resettlement program should be sustained by civil society organizations. So this is where we now um, play a vital role in relevant government agencies. Although we have already victories to claim, like the UDHA, like the main mainstreaming the people's plan, there are still crucial areas to address, like the income-based housing. It's still not income-based in the Philippines. Expansion of democratic participation, that it should not just be a token participation, that children, women, PWDs, all the sectors should be consulted. And lastly, our resettlement standards should align with those of the international agencies, standards of World Bank, ABB, JICA. This leads us to the next recommendation that I heard from Professor Hadis and Professor Raselis. According to them, for the housing scholar activists to be truly valuable in these reforms, we should be organically connected to social movement in order to produce research and studies that are relevant and matter hugely to the improvement of the well-being of our partners. If not, then we are just in our own intellectual bubble, floating and collecting high impact factor points. Lastly, even though it's people's plan, majority of the terms such as project timelines and policies are still heavily decided by the government, which I think is understandable on the part of the government coming from the orthodox top-down approach in project implementation. 
But for a true community-led approach to flourish, we should persist in pushing for the restructuring of power relations, going from beyond charitable-like participation mechanism towards true and equal relationship between the urban poor informal workers and the state. Thank you. Thank you for all the panelists. It was a great and enriching um, contribution inputs from all of you. And we will now proceed with our um, Q&A. And um, if I look at the number of questions, we will have um, quite some discussion. Get ready for that, I would suggest. And um, I just looked at the questions already for the uh, first panelists. And I suggest that I um, ask you a couple of questions, like one or two, um, and one common question for all of you, that would be um, what lessons you get for your own case from other presentations. So that is um, a sort of a common question that we'll be taking for all of you. And I will start with Ravia. I will use the um, sequence that we have. Ravia, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes. Um, so I have two questions to you. Mm -hmm. um, um, has there been mobilizations to stop the project? Are there legal options actually to um, stop it before it starts even? And um, re related to that, a very like sub question maybe: Has there been community cons consultations, and wh where where is the community in this entire story mm -hmm. in relation to mobilizations? Also, I think, uh, sorry, go ahead. And 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 one more, like I mean, maybe I should have told this. Um, I would like to give all of you five minutes to deal with the questions, and we go from one presentation to the other, and you will use that five minutes to answer all these questions. I didn't say this; just a uh, Parentheses again. So um, your first question about mobilization um, and the second one is um, has there been a public discussion about alternatives to world-class city which is more sustainable socially and ecologically like the public discussion discourse about this. Uh, if, uh, and your last question is the lessons you learned from other presentations. Okay. Um, actually, frankly, I mean, the other presentations were very impressive because they're working on ground and they've actually achieved um, concrete um, things. I mean, I would need more time to, uh, to talk to both of them. My, my, the one question for the Manila, uh, for Melissa would be, you know, uh, you are working with government and yet you're working with, in a community-led process. So how do you, you know, in terms of institution, how, you know, how do you fit into this? What's the model? You're not an NGO? But you're, you know, so I would, try, I would, I would like to understand the logistical or institutional model that you are using to actually do this, um, you know, to be part of this process, uh, because it reminds me of uh, Cody's work in uh, in Thailand. But I'm not sure how different it is or if it's exactly the same model, but, you know, because we want to understand how this can actually happen on ground. And uh, Vanessa's example, of course, uh, is very impressive because you've been in the field where the eviction is happening and um, Again, I would need, I would love to have a Skype meeting with both of you to understand more about all this. That would be really nice. Um, you guys want to answer any other questions? The Land Acquisition Act in, uh, in Pakistan is used, is the basic legal method to acquire land for these projects. So if the government is doing a project and the government um, wants to take, up, take land from the people, they will use the Land Acquisition Act. Um, in terms of what we can do legally, in legal terms to stop the project, the only uh, argument would be to have an argument in uh, in the public interest. Okay, this is against the public interest in some way, which so we haven't really explored that yet. We're still learning from all of this. Uh, the third point was: Has there been any agitation in civil society? So yes, one one issue has been the COVID uh, crisis because you know one it has led to a lack of transparency in many ways because we're all sitting in our homes and we're you know not really on you know outside and on the road you know in these areas. The second is that because of COVID, uh, we are not being able to meet up as much as we want would want. But despite that, there have been efforts where uh, a letter has been written to the prime minister. Um, presentations are being given to different government departments. Uh, 
plans are being made. One of the plans that is being worked on by civil society is that the proposal that along the 20 year floodplain, uh, they're proposing that this entire area should be turned into a public, uh, a national park, which means that legally you cannot do anything, you cannot build anything on that. And that national park would then be used only for recreational purposes. Uh, but the issue with that is that that is only 25% of the project area. The rest of the project area, what does that mean then? Will the project still happen in that? So this is a bit of a uh, complex issue that, we, that is still being resolved. Um, but there are, there, there are efforts to mobilize people, students, all of that. Um, the communities themselves, you know, what will they do? Um, we have seen in the past, in past examples, that there are two types of categories. One that wants to resist and does not want to leave the land and does not want to you know, be evicted clearly. And the other who's, who, who, if you present them with a huge sum of money and say, okay, here's some money for your land and just leave um, and sell everything, you know, many people will want to take that money and, and go away. Uh, what we've seen in, our, in the past examples is when this ha has happened in the, in the city of Lahore also, in terms of the newer housing schemes. When people leave, they face a lot of hardship in terms of resettling. Um, and they face a lot of hardship, even if they want to go to another village and settle there, there's a lot of resistance. Um, so the, it's not easy to resettle at all. Although the original, the initial sum of money that you have, you, you, you know, provided is always a lure and it works like that. It works as a bait, but in, in the long term, it doesn't really work out. Um, so yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, yes, thank you. And thank you for keeping to the time also. Um, is there anything that you guys want to add or shall I just go to Vanessa? Um, so in terms of uh, the communities mobilizing to sort of uh, protect their rights to land, in 2013 mm -hmm. when the project was introduced, uh, a small city near the bank of Ravi towards the northwest called Sharakpur, the people actually did gather together and they resisted this project. Uh, mm -hmm. It was then shared because of other reasons, but if you talk to some of them today, very few, uh, you can see that sentiment arising again of them uh, taking their stand once again and at least as an initial step asking the right questions about what, what will happen to their, to their community. So there, that's one, I guess, ray of hope. But to understand other uh, mobilization efforts, we ourselves need to uh, do more research on ground and the project has to be disseminated more amongst the masses for us to see a reaction. Okay, thanks a lot. I will move to Vanessa now. And Vanessa, I have two questions to you and the general question, the common question of the lessons, lessons learned from the other presentations. And the first question is, you already mentioned about like way forward points in your presentation. This is related to that. There were two questions. So what are the concrete measures, if you really think about the case that you're talking, that, that, that you were talking, what are the concrete measures to be taken to sustain the livelihoods of people who are living in river prones and dependent on, on living in there? So that is related um, to the second one. And would you have some, um, maybe brainstorming with us, like how um, to provide disaster resilient uh, resettlement areas and in relation to also if you would call like COVID like pandemics re also in relation to that if you could cover. Thank you. Thank you. Five um, minutes please. Yes definitely <laughs> not more than that. See in terms of uh, way forward it, because see one challenge that has been in terms of you know relocating such a huge population to one area is that most of these, the profile of those in the informal settlements are all working in the unorganized sector, which would include construction and women are predominantly involved in domestic, uh, as domestic helps. So, you know, you, you know, there are, there, actually one needs to understand that their uh, livelihood is location specific, you know, there is no way of resettling them and then looking forward for either skilling or anything of that sort, because they already have skills, they are already working. The only thing that one can do is to ensure that the, uh, the housing is very closer to their area of livelihoods because it is location centric. So that's one thing, you know, because we have seen in the Kuwam River restoration, we've fought tooth and nail to ensure that, you know, uh, some sort of a livelihood uh, 
upgradation happens even in the resettlement site. But what happened was, you know, you take a person who has been, uh, you know, say making bamboos or, you know, uh, let's say uh, they were involved in say domestic health and there you're going there and now there is too much of supply there because the de uh, and the demand is less. And what we have done is we started making all the women tailors or into puppet making. And there is a gender stereotype in the kind of livelihoods that's being promoted also. So the, this has not worked much. So uh, our idea is to ensure to, to minimize the livelihood crisis. It is better that we look at institute upgradation or, uh, or uh, you know, proximate resettlement. And the second thing about lessons learned, see, we are already uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, community participation, there has been none, actually, if you look at it. And this pandemic has actually exposed a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the gaps in the existing housing process. But however, what we've learned is government of Tamil Nadu has actually proposed a housing policy with no consultation with communities whatsoever. And they just... Uh, that be just because uh, it was one of the prerequisites for a World Bank project, they came up with a housing policy uh, where some of our points have been included, but yet, you know, the community consultation was completely not there. And that comes to the question of disaster resilient. I think uh, that there are plenty of ways in which you can construct disaster resilient housing. One, it has to be incorporated in the policy of the state. Secondly, the only solution that the government can really look forward to minimize all the negative effect of adverse effect of all of this is by consulting community that comes to the third question that is what i liked about the one of the presentations where you know they've actually demonstrated the community consultation process in fact melissa would like to learn more about it because that will be very useful for us to you know advocate with our government because our government believes that we will create a housing stock in the suburbs and then we will decide who will go and occupy those houses instead of houses being designed for communities it's like yeah. housing stocks created and then people are pushed there right so uh, yeah. that would be definitely you know if we have such models it'll be easier for us to not definitely easier but it will be useful for us to kind of advocate with the government yeah. i hope it answers everything thanks Vanessa. it was really a rich answer, at least to me. <laughs> so I will uh, go to Melissa now uh, with, um, let me see, one small, three questions again. Melissa, um, we have this, actually this question is for all of the presenters, but I will ask in your case in Manila, uh, what is the role of civil society and academics in working with the community and policymakers? Could you just elaborate on this and also maybe in relation to um, raising awareness to right to housing or right to right to the community and working with uh, policymakers at the same time. And this is the first one. And the second one is more of a follow up question. Um, at which point in the process is the decision taken as to who would receive um, a unit and were the relocators given land titles and they were i mean could they afford it was it affordable the aspect of affordability and how that was in the project um and the third one is the lessons that you would take from the other presented presenters please thank you thank you bahar for this uh, three questions so for the first question uh, the role of civil society the ngos and the academic in um, pushing for um, uh, right to adequate housing and right to the city. Well, we are, um, um, we have been consolidated. Uh, we are a cohesive group. Um, even in the time of pandemic, we continue to um, connect with one another. We continue to um, link up with one another and talk about, you know, the advocacies that are needed for this uh, community. So we, we really take on an active role, even uh, doing it online so we meet we even meet with the resettlement sites uh, leaders we um, um, go zoom meetings with them but then of course uh, we have these limitations not all can uh, come but then most can come and so we take on this role of uh, um, bringing their um, uh, demands to the government you know, to 
maybe it's also one of my advantages because right now I don't work with the government anymore. I work with the university and I also, I'm also active in NGO work. So we know how to navigate the government context. We know how we have champions. We know we have champions in uh, lower house and uh, also in Senate and also in other government institutions. So we take this role as to uh, consolidate the demands, the concerns. We, we meet with the leaders, we meet with the communities, we uh, look after them. It's really a partnership that we maintain and not just with the community, but also with the civil society in general. And um, we decide collectively on the advocacies that we will bring to the, the government. Uh, also about our approaches, we also decide on that. So very active role at the moment, no? the civil society. Although um, it's hard, but then um, uh, we've already um, accomplished so much. No? And these small victories are very important. Small and big, big victories are very important in organizing, not just at the level of the community and even for us, no? the CSOs. This uh, motivate us to move further and uh, to continue working. For the second uh, question about um, decision, decision on uh, who will uh, get the housing uh, unit, who, who will benefit from the resettlement package? Well, it depends, no? It depends on uh, the implementing agencies. Uh, if you have the World Bank, if you have the uh, ADB, if you have international organizations, then the cutoff is, um, you know, the time of the census. So for all the families who were census during the cutoff, then they, and they are informal settler families, then they deserve relocation package. And for affordability, well, there's no question with um, the resettlement sites that are uh, located 30 to 50 kilometers away because they're pretty cheap. No? But then the problem is that they're far away. You'll die there. No? You can afford it, but then you will die there. Eventually, you cannot pay anymore. So that is what the government offers right now. For the people's plan, well, this is still what we're fighting for because the land in the city is expensive. So if you will buy the land and if you will let the families pay also for the land, it will really be fortune. No? It would cost them a fortune, which is why we partner with local uh, government agencies and we partner with um, uh, government uh, uh, agencies who own the land. So it, we make it use of rock that they still maintain the ownership of the land and it's just the units that the families will uh, buy so that they can afford. It's still, it's still this, there are some families, families who only earn like one dollar or two dollars a day cannot afford that uh, people's plan in the city because it's expensive which is why we're pushing for income based no? it cannot be based on ten thousand like uh right now uh, a family who can stay in people's plan project in the city should have at least uh two hundred dollars uh, um, household income combined household income if not, then they cannot afford the um, monthly amortization. But that shouldn't be the case. It should be the state who should take over. It should be the state who should make it happen for all of them, for all of the informal settlers to stay in the city because they're citizens of the city. And we know already there are mounting evidence, irrefutable evidence that if you relocate them far away, 30 to 50 kilometers away, even if you have all the social services, basic services, for as long as there's no livelihood there, they'll die, they'll survive, they won't survive. So there's already a cost benefit analysis made between the people's plan and the offsite resettlement. And based on the uh, CBA, the cost benefit analysis, it's really, wiser, way wiser to resettle the families in city. Uh, for the third lesson, well, 
uh, we already have the Philippines already have the the policies and we have the UDHA, we have process. But then uh, what's happening now in India are still happening in the Philippines. So we really have to guard these policies. We really have to guard the procedure. We don't slip back no, from where we came from. And also the presentation of uh, Rabia that um, you should look at the approach of the uh, government in development through different lenses, through different theories, because that's your weapon when you approach them, when you uh, do a counter um, argument with them that, uh, you know, you're saying this is for public trust. Why is it that this is not what we're seeing at the moment? So it's important that you also have this uh, different lenses. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Thank you for all of you. Um, I think I need to round the discussion part and I will give the floor to Banashri to have a reflection of all the cases presented and then wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Bahar. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to uh, do a wrap up of all the cases. I think uh, it was uh, a very rich uh, discussion. But I think uh, I will start with what uh, Melissa implied in the end. What she implied is that there's no place for complacency. You know? That uh, even if you, uh, you know, manage to get things right in some places, you have to keep on hammering, uh, uh, you know, to to get things right in, in all the places. And then, uh, what? I, but before that, let me just uh, share with you why uh, from the Institute of, for Housing and Urban Development Studies, IHS, we thought of organizing this particular um, webinar. And that was, it goes back to uh, a refresher course we did for our alumni in Chennai which was about uh, riverfront uh, development, uh, Matip 2017, right? And then uh, uh, that was the time that we also met uh, Vanessa and who was an excellent uh, resource person. And uh, we got a whole lot of resource people together from uh, different places in India and from uh, around uh, different places, including uh, the Philippines. And uh, what we, uh, you know, of course, we did realize that uh, riverfront development for the last uh, 30 years, it's been, uh, you know, something which is going on in all cities of the world. And it has uh, become a kind of a city worlding process in the sense that you clean up the river, you make it accessible to people uh, in uh, the form of parks, and then the dividend of a clean river and uh, actually comes onto the properties which are around, which then uh, go up in value, and then with, then starts the process of uh, you know a different set of users of the land, which come into this around in and around the river. But then, um, uh, so these are the kind of questions that we discussed uh, in that uh, the social and economic costs of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, these riverfront uh, developments. And after that, uh, since then, we've been doing things in our small ways from IHS to keep this theme alive. Yeah? And uh, so, and here we are partnering with uh, INHAP. And uh, the idea also is to take uh, this kind of network forward. And because, uh, you know, this uh, uh, business of waterfront development, riverfront development, it has, uh, uh, it is not like other uh, forms of uh, urban development in the sense that there is a, a resource sitting in these cities, which is really like Rabia was saying, uh, it's really become the kind of a backyard of the city because of pollution and um, because of, and also because of all the flooding that happens occasionally and things like that. So uh, to revive this uh, resource, and uh, bring it up front, it's not a simple thing because there are already existing users. You have people who derive their incomes from the uh, river as all of them uh, talked about. You have uh, people who settled there for generations. Yeah? 
because that land was not wanted by anybody. Yeah? It had its uh, problems. It was getting flooded and all sorts of things. So as the poor who settled there because of the proximity to uh, the city to be able to access the city, job opportunities and everything. Now, all of a sudden, because of this, the equation changes that everybody, you know, some other groups then, uh, uh, you know, think that this land uh, then is attractive for other things. Yeah? And then uh, comes the issue of what is the, uh, being uh, done about the original inhabitants. Now, if we look at uh, the Indian uh, case, there, uh, uh, you know, is the uh, issue that uh, in, we have, you know, the smart city mission which has a hundred cities, yeah, which are seen as uh, smart cities. And then in that uh, whole smart city mission, uh, there are, uh, you know, about 50 of them, which have waterfront development as one of uh, the project uh, options. And uh, I must say that a lot of these uh, projects cannot go ahead just because of this whole issue of the uh, original inhabitants who are there and that the relocation or the rehabilitation of these people has not been properly worked out. So I think um, it's time that we learn from all these uh, examples and we come together to uh, you know, really form a larger network of people who are working, of people and institutions who can get together and uh, look at this whole riverfront development, which is good for cities in the end. But how should it, uh, you know, reduce the disbenefits uh, to uh, the poor and the marginalized? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Banashree. Thank you very much, everyone. I think this was a very nice ending. I think this is, I think this is a nice start of us getting together and everyone who's working on this type of projects to join forces in order to see whether yeah, we can have a better approach to this, that affected communities will have a better end and a better, yeah, the realization of the right to adequate housing is respected. Um, I'm looking at the time. I think we're perfectly on time. So I'm very happy with that as well. Congratulations to all of us. Um, now I'm looking at Inhav. Kirti, you want to say a final few words? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to say three things. First is, of course, thank you very much, Marty. Thank you very much, IHS, for this incredibly rich uh, sharing that has happened today. We're very, very grateful and we're very proud that, that uh, we did this together. We have been planning this for last three months. And honestly, I'm, I'm very happy that it's been so rich in terms of uh, the content and the ideas that, that came through. I must, I must uh, take this opportunity to thank the panel. And I would be uh, missing something if I didn't give the names. I'm grateful to Rabia, Melissa, Banashi, of course, Marty, Baha, and Vanessa for incredibly, honestly, very, very rich presentation. What, what this particular meeting has brought out uh, uh, is this, that, uh, that we have destroyed our rivers. We have made our rivers, which were assets into liabilities. And therefore, it's very important that we develop we develop those rivers. The questions are, what is this development? Development for whom? Development at what cost? And is inclusive, people-centric, poor-sensitive poor development possible or not? And these are the issues we have been debating for ages, and we are still debating them. There's nothing wrong about debating, but we've got to kind of come to a realization that time has come, that we redefine our development and keep people in the center of the process and we, we remain 
sensitive to the poor and their, their, their needs. Second thing that I want to kind of you know, use this opportunity of thanking everyone is to tell those who are in the audience and those who are listening otherwise, that as you know, we are organizing 30 webinars and today we completed 11th webinar. There are 19 more webinars to go and all of them are geared towards one theme. That's rethinking cities, rethinking Indian cities especially. We are saying there is need to look at our cities all over again, replan them, rethink them, reorganize them for many reasons. One of the many reasons is, uh, is, uh, is, is how we're developing our rivers. So I wanted to kind of tell everyone, especially the people who are listening, that we need your feedback. We have completed one third of the webinars. We want to learn from you. In terms of what do you think of the webinars we are organizing, the subject we are selecting, the manner in which we are handling the subject, and the way we deliver the whole thing kindly write to them, it will, it will enrich our experience, it will allow us to kind of improve our performance, that's number one. Number two is this, that this particular webinar itself, we will, we, they will greatly uh, enrich if interesting feedback comes to us. The reason is simple, that uh, they have, we have talked about you know, uh, riverfront development in Lahore and talked in, in, in Manila and of course in Chennai, but there are seven more major riverfront development is happening. Sabarmati has already taken place. There's a Gomti River development, Yamuna River development, Hindula River development, Pune, Brahmaputra, and Godavari River development. Now these are large projects. They are the ones, you know, but in fact, large numbers of people, thousands of people. And I'm not talking only in terms of those who are in this displaced and replaced. I'm also talking about those who will benefit. There's a huge amount of thinking that to be done. Lots of ideas are to be generated. So I want to kind of use this opportunity to, to request and tell you that if you start thinking about your riverfront development project in Pune, please know that we are interested in taking that step further. As a matter of fact, we are planning good number of webinars related to specific city. And I think you know, we'll announce them pretty soon, but that would be an occasion to get together again. And therefore, Kindly accept my thanks for coming. Kindly accept my thanks you know, for participating. And kindly, I think, tell us what you think of this effort. And kindly kind of see that we improve our performance as we get along. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, IHS. Thank you, all the panelists. And thank you, my team. Of course, I must thank my friend Sunil, who thank who who introduced the whole, 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 whole webinar and uh, the team behind the scene, which is managing this very, very skillfully. Uh, Marty, you must have found that they are uh, incredibly cooperative and supportive people behind behind the scene. Perfect. And Perfect. but for them, this would not have been a success as no. it is. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.